Namaste. Um, and knowing wrongness, uh, this presentation focuses on one strand of my research into the approach, methods, and outcomes as a typographic designer based in London to form the basis of a practice-based PhD at RMIT in Melbourne, Australia. The question I'm asking is how can a, a knowing wrongness of typographic experiment and print processes lead to new forms within typographic practice? With designers using the same tools, visual references, and production techniques, how can any new work contain elements of bespokeness and creativity? Can ugly and beauty exist at the same time? The advance of readily available technology and the general awareness of graphic design over recent years has enabled anyone with basic software knowledge or little training to be competent at creating a piece of visual communication. Designers and non-designers throughout the world are all using the same easy-to-use software and have access to the same new fonts. Work lifted and regurgitated from blogs with little or no context can lead to a uniform blandness with everything looking the same after a while. The individual hand of the graphic designer has been replaced by the digital cut and paste generation with any idea of bespokeness or individuality in danger of being lost. In this millennium, a world of post-postmodernism, there seems to be an overall drive for perfection within design and production, with better and better typefaces being produced, combined with higher and higher resolution images printed on modern, cleaner, more accurate presses, with overall less and less human intervention. Clean is the norm. Graphic design has certainly entered mainstream culture. Here we see a contemporary coffee shop, the Commission, at London Heathrow Airport, clean, minimal, on the high street. With typography being at the heart of what I do, the choice of a typeface is a key factor. We had a question earlier on. The history behind the font, its visual appearance, and the feeling or emotion that this conveys are all of equal importance. Contemporary typeface design, in terms of technological advances and drawing quality, has reached not only the highest quality, but the largest choice. But why do I struggle to use these new fonts? Certainly the fact that they are perfect, with a machine-like quality lacking the idiosyncrasies present in hot metal composition is certainly a factor. And using them straight out of the tin almost feels too easy, as if the designer doesn't have much to do. The hand of the type designer might be visible, but what about the hand of the graphic designer? Is this now being lost? My recent work as a practicing designer in London reacts against this contemporary backdrop, intentionally setting myself apart from the mainstream in order to create work that is original with evidence of the designer's hand, both as manual and digital manifestations. Using type design software the wrong way or software developed for other uses coupled with a system-driven art practice approach has in some part led to a new way of thinking about graphic design and its production. At first glance, this double page spread looks like a normal, straightforward, well-considered book made to certain high standards. But when we zoom in, you will notice that, you might notice, maybe on this screen you might not, um, that the typeface is in fact two typefaces alternating between each other. We have Palatino by Herman Zaff and Trump Medieval by George Trump. If you look at the R's in territory and the D's in addresses, you'll see that they're ever so slightly different. This can be done relatively easily by making a hybrid font that uses the contextual feature in OpenType to automatically alter the font when typeset. These interruptions are a reoccurring theme in my practice. To some recent history, the manipulation of existing fonts really started to take shape in the late 1980s when graphic designers, as opposed to type designers, could open and edit digital fonts, chopping bits off, adding bits from other fonts, and so on. Layered punk new wave typography was in its heyday with the influential book Typography Now, The Next Wave, edited by Rick Pointer, published in 1989. Max Kisman created Fedoni, in 1991, which was a mix of Bodoni and Futura. 
prototype by Jonathan Barnbrook in 1995 is another combination of a sans and a serif in upper and lower case. Fuse in 1992, with Neville Brodie and John Rosencroft's experimental publication on fonts and typography showcased and distributed experimental, illegible, conceptual typeface to a wide desktop publishing audience. In 2013, I conceived Megafont, which is a typeface made up of 52 different typefaces, each unique for uppercase and lowercase characters, all being of a similar grotesque. This was a reaction to the number of sans serif fonts being made that were so similar to each other. Why choose one when you can choose them all? Megafont was made for a publication, Manarg, by David Berridge, published by X Marks the Box Ship in London, described as a jumbled exercise in reading about writing and writing about reading. Aligning each letter to the X height gave the typeface some kind of uniform evenness that in turn contrasts with its wrongness in ever so slightly different microspaces of weight, character shapes, ascenders and descenders. This was followed by a serif version, Sentry Megafont, constructed of 52 versions of Sentry typefaces with an added feature of randomness within each letter, again made possible with 26 sets of contextual alternatives. So if you look, the T's are different in the example. These megafonts and their various incarnations and reincarnation bring a certain unequal, uneven, and unresolved texture when used. Ooh. A wrongness, a flicker, a flicker on the screen, and a flicker on the page, rem reminiscent of letterpress printing, with all its faults and misprints. In many ways, it seems that the text has been handset and printed badly. Through embracing a notion of chance, you don't know what letter's gonna be set next, the typeface comes alive. Another form of type ha hacking is to alter the letter forms or parts of the letter forms themselves. Radical Essex was a font made for a radical modernist architectural project in the UK. And this was created by simply turning all the curved points of Helvetica from round to straight and then jumbling them together. It's a kind of form of type designing without designing type. Countershift transposes the counters of one typefaces, of one typeface to that of another. In this instance, the swapping of the counters of Futura Book with Futura Bold, and Futura Book with Futura Bold Condensed. This again creates an uneven An, un an uneven effect when used to set text, partly as the letters that don't have counters are left unchanged. 2015, I worked with the artist Fiona Banner in creating a typeface constructed from a blend of all the typefaces she uses in her work. Font was made with the interpolation tool in type design software, normally used to blend, say, a bold weight of a typeface with a lightweight of a typeface to create the regular weight. Using this software intentionally wrong by blending a serif typeface with a sans serif typeface, and then again with a badly designed free font, produced this new bastard form of aesthetic ugliness. The conceptual artist, Giorgio Sadotti, imposes a system that plays out in many forms to create an artwork. I became involved in producing this work primarily due to my technical production and typographic knowledge. Conceptual typefaces soon followed the same approach. This font is called Heidi, or Hyde, which is a font with letters within letters. The first line shows an A within an A, which is simply an A, followed by a B within an A, and so on. And again, this font would have 26 variations. Split Swiss, simply, a font called Swiss, and it's split in half. Roll font, a font rolling round a cylinder. 
These typefaces, strong in a systematic approach, are often legible, in many ways all wrong. However, they've created a new way of making fonts that have a system playing out. Rather than designing particular aesthetic letter forms, the font is created through the design of a framework that is then rolled out. Writing, Illuminating and Lettering by Edward Johnson, first published in 1906, talks about the skeleton form or essential letter, uh, essential form of a letter. Recent online parametric type design software such as Prototypo uses this method as the basic form for the creation of do-it-yourself typefaces. Even a relatively monolinear sans serif such as Accidents Grotesque has undergone very small adjustments to every curve to form its character and produce an, an even rhythm when set as words and sentences. I became curious to see if I could reverse this process and theoretically redraw the skeleton of existing fonts, which of course never really existed. I think you can just see the, uh, the magenta line is the skeleton drawing of Accidents Grotesque. I was interested in erasing the optical alterations that have been made to sans serif typefaces, but still retaining the original skeleton shape of the design. And the system we used was just drawing completely down the middle. So the magenta line is exactly the halfway point of the letter, uh, halfway point of the font. So you'll see that the baseline is not due to the systematic and strict approach of plotting the midpoint of each stroke. But it, this has created a new typeface. And the skeleton form could be stroked to produce any desired weight. That has certain characteristics of the original Accidents Grotesque font, but with new characteristics that are a consequence of this process. Again, this is typeface design without actually drawing the letters based on visual judgments. There would be a temptation to correct the unevenness, the irregularity, but to me that's the whole process, what it was all about, not to optically correct. This is a watercolor robot drawing machine that paints in watercolor any image that you feed into it that's been vectorized. Its software, StippleGin, maps a continuous line for the brush to follow, as opposed to Adobe Illustrator that would create a series of traced lines. I noticed that each time the task was performed, a different path would be drawn. So I wondered what would happen if you could apply this to a letter form. So the software is creating the letter A as a continuous path. Each time there's a different path, each time there's a different letter A. And these can all be saved as vectors and then imported into some kind of type design software as multiple alternative characters that can be used to create a typeface with infinite number of variables. So again, it's designing type without designing type. Mimeographica Alphabetica was an exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery in 2014 and was the result of a series of workshops exploring the possibilities of stencil lettering systems and mimeograph printing, which is in itself a form of stencil duplicating. Here, I drew through both the uppercase stencil and lowercase stencil at the same time to create this abstract font. The letter forms were cut by hand as paper stencils, printed on basic stencil duplicator, and shown with the printer as part of the overall installation. These abstract letter forms move from typographic to graphic, from text to image, through a revival of stencil production and stencil print processes. Typography is also concerned with the arrangement of type. Early in my undergraduate course at the University of Reading in the 1990s, Professor Michael Twyman gave a lecture, Typography Without Words, that used a simple notation to teach the graphic variables and basic hierarchy of typography. Through examples of different combinations of lines using X's, zeros, and I's, with varying space, typography was simplified into abstract graphic forms and began to make sense to me, 
the use of both positive and negative space to create structure, hierarchy, and meaning. Another key moment of my education was understanding the relationship between type size, line length, and leading. The dimensional relationships in the composition of text published in the Stafford Papers in the 1970s compared the same piece of text set at the same size with five different leadings, 8 point, 9 point, 10 point, 11 point, 12 point, and three line lengths, 27, 20, and 13 pikers. Through this example, I could see immediately see the effect that each variable had on each other. The longer the line length, the more leading required. Some such stories as a recent book that takes on board these principles of hierarchy and arrangement, but uses all of them at the same time in an, unexpe in a, in a unexpected and expanded manner. Centered, justified, range left, and range right, all on one page. These risky combinations of arrangement make some kind of sense due to the book's theme of disbursement and the experimental nature of the publisher, combined with my ambition to try and do something new to push this discipline. A rigorous execution of microspacing and typographic rigor, which is always present in the work, creates a tension of typographic do's and don'ts existing at the same time. Shonky, the aesthetics of awkwardness, combines a knowingly wrong approach in both form and letter form. 16 fonts, one font for each section of the book, were designed with the online font tool Prototypo using parametric sliders that affect all the letters at the same time as opposed to individually. individually. Rather like pushing all the controls on a music mixing desk to their extreme, to create a distorted sound. Each typeface is distorted within a different slider, curviness, serif, serif width, or serif arc. Paragraphs were set in a rotating sequence of these 16 fonts, mixed with a dared centered arrangement throughout the entire book, setting a fitting, shonky atmosphere. My unrelentless strive to create bespoke and unique outcomes, both in terms of form and letter form, through unconventional methods of pr process and production, coupled with a consistently, inconsistently, knowingly wrong approach, is an alternative to the, to the, to the now so-called cafe normal of graphic design. Thank you very much.